right, this is philosophy class eight, right? Eight. Not bad. We're getting there. Very happy. Look at this. And you guys, uh, you know, have got great attendance in this class, which I'm very proud of you guys. That, that means a lot. And so, because you, you don't have to be here, but you are. And that tells me something. It tells me you're interested and you are um, engaged. That's good. Okay. We were just talking a little bit about um, communism, right? And I was making the claim, you know, philosophically, there's uh, um, politics is really the public use of philosophy, okay? It's the expression of philosophy. So in America, we have certain uh, philosophical views. Our government is grounded on natural law, and we have a, what's called a free market economy. To some degree, it's mixed, actually, because there are certain things that the government provides that would be some kind of socialistic type things, like uh, education is socialized to some degree. Uh, we go to public education, I went to public education. And some would argue that that's horrible. That public education, they would say, is horrible because it doesn't produce uh, great results. That's why people send their kids to what? Private schools. Makes sense. Uh, presidents uh, send their kids to uh, really, you know, expensive private institutions, right? Uh, they don't send their, their kids to, you know, the Brooklyn Unified School District or Independent School District, whatever it is. You know, they, they send them to private ones. Well, okay. Well, in communism, there is no private, uh, there's no private ownership, okay? Everything is public. Uh, so in communism, you don't really get um, to make choices over such things government makes choices. So when the government um, gives you something, the government does what government does. It governs. Make sense? They're going to give you school. They're going to govern what school you go to, uh, how long you go there, what subjects you learn, what subjects you do not learn, right? And remember the sound of one hand clapping. If the government doesn't like it, then the government will not allow it. Okay, so it's always good to be in control of government, and that's why communism is scary, because it's a one-party system, which means there's no opposition. In communism, if you are in that, especially in China, if you're not in the, if you're not in the party, the communist party, then you are party list, which means you don't get to vote, okay? And you have to achieve certain things or adhere to certain things to be in that party. For example, you, you can't be a member of a church in China or any religious group, right? So this is legal uh, legal atheism, okay? So that, that, that really silences those who have a moral voice that comes from Christianity, Taoism, uh, Buddhism, or whatever they may be practicing in China, right? There's a, a larger population of Christians, they say, in China than in America, okay? You go, well, that seems so odd. They're Asian, right? Because, you know, but uh, they're, it's, un, it's an underground church, and then they have the official state church where you sign up and you have to register. Um, but they're, they're, there's over a billion people there, which is quite a lot of people. So, um, so we're talking about China and why they don't necessarily invent a lot of things. Rather, they steal a lot of technology. Well, why would you, why would a communist country not invent a lot of things? Well, because under communism, you're not allowed to benefit from your ingenuity, right? In America, if I create an iPhone or a better one, I'm a billionaire. I make a lot of money. I reap the rewards of my ingenuity, of my labor, of my of what it takes to create a cell phone that can sit there and create a video that I get to talk to you on. That I could make billions, that if I'm really good at a certain task, if I am gifted in a way, whether it be intellectually or even physically like sports stars, right? 
that I should be able to benefit from that to, some, to, to, to whatever degree, not to some degree, but to the, the sky's the limit and even that's not the limit, okay? That, that doesn't exist in communist countries. So they take away the, the motivation for people to work hard. They take away the motivation for people to create anything beyond what there is gonna be used in their own home. And so the government says, well, what technology are we going to get? How are we gonna get this? Well, they can hire people to do it, but the people are only going to work their, you know, eight hour a day job, and then they're gonna go home. They're not gonna sit there and toil over this stuff all night because like a Steve Jobs would, right? I gotta figure this out. And then he creates the, the iPhone, right? And then next thing you know, bam, he's just super wealthy. And, or like, you know, who's the Tesla guy right now? Um, Elon Musk. Elon Musk. How can I make a car that, everybody's saying we need electric cars, but electric cars stink because they don't have power, they're not that fast, they're not that cool. How can I make, when then he makes, when I see his video of, of a Tesla beating a Lamborghini in like a half mile, it's, no, it's, it, it was a half mile race, but up until the half mile, quarter mile part, part, the Tesla was winning. And I'm like, oh my God, a Tesla's beating a Lambo, you know? And so that's, well, he's motivated. He's gonna be doing this and he's, he's a genius. He's gonna be using his genius. Let's make it, guy's a billionaire. So these communist countries are not going to be able to keep up with us in, in innovation because it lacks motivation. You have no reason to, to work hard. In fact, that was one of the biggest problems with the Soviet Union uh, is that they, they had shortages of things like toilet paper and bread, all these things. Why did they have shortages of them? Because nobody wanted to work. And what they were doing is they would lie on the ledger of how much they produced and the boss would give them a little bump in pay because he had a number, a quota, that if he reached, he would get a bump, so he'd kind of trickle down a bit. And so there, there was all a big lie on paper. They had produced all these goods, but yet the cupboards were bare when you went to the markets and there were lines around buildings. And so one of the, one of the stories was if you saw a line at a store, you got in it because you didn't know what they had. They just got something. And knowing that there was a shortage, you jumped in line. You know, could be what you need. And then there, there are fights, there are videos back in the 80s of fights between men and women, literally men stealing things from women at the grocery store, you know, they had this old meat counter and you, you didn't know what kind of meat it was, literally because they had shortages and so, they're just grabbing whatever's packaged there and the guy rips this thing out of the hands of a woman and fists start flying and right? communism. Anyway. I talk about that today because of something I watched uh, about political philosophy. It's all philosophy, remember. Uh, a guy was discussing education and how undereducated we are today about the application of certain philosophies that are going on throughout the nations and stuff like that. How many of you know who Adolf Hitler was? None of you, that's a joke. The camera doesn't show how many hands went up. Two, and I'm joking, all of your hands went up, right? That guy, how many people, can somebody tell me how many people he killed? You can't, can you? Yeah, I think the number they throw out is six million. I've heard up to 12 million, okay? Because, you know, there are people who are unaccounted for still and all that, okay? Um, anybody tell me who Joseph Stalin was? was you it, can. Wasn't he like the leader of the Soviet Union? Yes, yes. Is he a good guy or a bad guy? Bad. Didn't do so well under yeah, I like him. how, uh, huh? <laughs> it didn't do so well under him, of course. What does that mean, not do so well? Um, well, wasn't that like the Soviet Union was communist? 
Yeah, they were communists. Sure. Yeah, so like you said that there's shortages. And Is that the only reason he is a bad guy? Because they had shortages and of bread? He like killed a lot of people. Anyone that tried to go against him, he killed. Anyone who went against him. Mm -hmm. I see why he was. Okay, so uh, how many people would you say uh, the Soviet Union uh, is responsible for killing? I'm not sure. Not sure. Is he better or worse than Hitler? Who would you rather live with, him or Hitler? Neither. Neither? That wasn't the question. Um, you have two worlds. America doesn't exist and Europe doesn't exist. The world was broken into two spots. Hitler won half. Have you not seen the movie The Man in the High Castle? It's where, uh, uh, it's not the movie, it's a show where, I, I haven't watched all of it. Turns out um, it's a dystopic uh, film that means bad society, utopia means good society, dystopia means bad society. Uh, it, it, it imagines a, a situation where the Nazis and the Japanese won World War II, right? But imagine a world where uh, it's either all communism or all national socialism under the Nazi regime. Which one would you rather be in? It could have been that way. I mean, the Nazis could have taken over, you know, Europe, and maybe let's pretend that um, uh, the communists who did want to take over the world and still do, uh, actually got at least halfway. Which one would you rather be in? And let's pretend those are the only two regimes on earth. Neither one would be good, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a hard question. That's that, that's unfair. Okay. Um, what do you think? Remind me your name. You're wearing the Oakland A's hat. I was a big Oakland A's fan back when I was young. Uh, Kevin. Kevin. Kevin, tell me where. Tell me about this. Tell me. Tell me a little bit about why Stalin was so bad. Was he worse than Hitler or better than Hitler? Depends on what you think. But go ahead. Yeah, he did. Just as bad. Right. Who killed more people? I don't know how many people Stalin killed, but I'm more familiar with Hitler. So. You know, okay, and that, that's what I'm getting at is you're more familiar with Hitler, but you're not familiar with Stalin. Is somebody Googling it right now? I've got a number. I got a number. I, I, I've got several numbers in my head. head. And I don't want to say it because then if I'm wrong, because if Google tells me I'm wrong, then I'm going to be embarrassed. Should I write it down and see if I'm right? I'm going to argue 60 million. I've heard up, upwards toward 90 million. What did you get? Um, Wikipedia says 20. Wikipedia says 20. Mm -hmm. I've heard that on the low end. Uh, I've heard the high end being up to 90. Maybe that's China. How many people have, has chi a communist China killed? Maoism. The great leap forward, right? See, this is a political philosophy. This is all philosophy applied, okay? To how we should rule our lives in government. So when we're talking about things like knowledge, like justify true belief, which we're gonna jump right back into, that will eventually determine, that will move all the way up to politics. It will move into theology, what you think about God, and how you think about government, okay? And so these, these are the result, communism is the result of a philosophical paper by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Okay, called the Communist Manifesto. You may get the number. Maoism. How many people did Maoism kill? M A O. Says two point five million. But the did you say how many what? Two point five. Two point five million. That's rather low, don't you think? Yeah, but it said the death toll was around 40 million. 40 million. So it said like 2.5 million were killed killed and or, and were tortured. Tortured. And only 2.5. Well, that might right. have been just towards his reign. Yeah. But we're talking the whole history of communist China. Well, go ahead. This one is saying they're not quite sure. But of course it's not. Between, they're saying anywhere between 20 and 45. 
20 and 45. 20 45. That is a big, we don't know, it could be upwards to an extra 25 million, right? Yeah. So, you know, you got 20 million that we could be sure of, perhaps. Oh, wait, no. Oh, wait, no, wait. I can tell you the Comet Rouge this, this went. Is combined to sure, I guarantee you that's going to be who. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Talk to a communist, they're like, no, we, we didn't kill anybody. 70, <laughs> How many? 77? Yeah. yeah. So we got Stalin killing 20 at least, right? We got. We got Communist China killing upwards to 90 million people. The Khmer Rouge, when they went into Cambodia, they killed one out of every four people. They had 16 million people in their country. That means they killed four million. Four, that's just, that's a small country of 16 million people in Cambodia. The killing fields, anybody here? Why did they kill them? What's the bottom line on this? Because they disagreed with them politically. Did you catch that? So I'm gonna have you guys, here's, here's something I want you to listen to. Memorize. Write it down, or not, or just watch the video a lot. I don't care. You're gonna have to write it down, you can just watch the video over and over and over and over again. Helps my algorithm anyway. What is today a matter of academic speculation? Uh, I blew it. What is today a matter of academic speculation begins tomorrow to move armies and pull down empires. This is not my own quote. Okay, it's Macon's report. I'll give you a spelling of that at a later date. What is today a matter of academic speculation begins tomorrow to move armies and pull down empires. I expect you to know this extra credit on the final maybe might be just a half the test who knows what is today a matter of academic speculation begins tomorrow to move armies and pull down empires what is today a matter of academic speculation begins tomorrow to move armies and pull down empires What is today a matter of academic speculation begins tomorrow to move armies and pull down empires? What I am doing right here may seem insignificant to you. You may forget that I teach you these things, that I say these things, but they will go into your mind and you will draw conclusions from them. And those conclusions you will take to church, you will take to the voting booth, you'll take to your families and friends who will do the same. You may not ever remember, I've, you know, we've talked about such things. You may somewhere down the line think you concluded yourself, and that's all fine and well. You're a college now. This has been going on with you since you were a baby, since mom and dad started teaching you teaching you to do certain things that are right or wrong, to look at the world a certain way, to see it, perceive it as, rather than perceive that it's that way. You want to perceive that, okay? Who watched the video from last week? Probably none of you because it just came up this week. It is up, okay? I made a distinction between perceiving as versus perceiving that, okay? I perceive that the railroad tracks get closer as they get farther away from you. But you do not perceive that they get closer, right? The train is not getting smaller, the tracks are not getting closer, correct? As children, you're, you're taught certain things and then you look at the world a certain way and you interpret it a certain way, okay? You can perceive it as just or unjust. The hope is that you're perceiving it accurately perceiving that it is just in this one instance or unjust in this one instance. If you think it's all unjust, then we're in trouble. Then we need to get rid of our government, start over, right? And 
And that's what a lot of people do when they're promoting communism. They are telling you that right now America is an unjust country, completely. It is rotten to the core in the way that it was created. It was created by racist, rich, un immoral people. And they created it in such a way that it is always going to be unjust. Thus, we need to do what? Get rid of it and replace it. What are these people wanting to replace our current government with? Socialism. What is socialism? Socialism is Marxism. What is Marxism? Communism. Communism. The USSR did not call itself the Communist Party of Russia. They called it the Soviet Union, Socialist Republic, that to be received. It was a socialist republic. The result of their certain foundational beliefs resulted in a form of government that controlled everything. Totalitarianism. Totalitarianism is an attempt to control all facets of human existence. And in doing so, those who disagreed with it were seen as enemies of the state. And if you were enemies of the state, they were seen as people that were irrational and unable they are unable and unwilling to discuss this with. They are not seen as just misguided people. They are evil, and thus they needed to be eradicated. And that is why you get the killing fields of Cambodia. That's why you get between 20 and 45 million people. You can't even count them, can you? Not you personally. Between what was it? Upwards to 75 million of their own people. We have killed more people in the 20th century than the history of the earth. I mean, has killed. I'm not saying you've killed more people than there are people. That would be hard to do. Okay? The 20th century has been literally, the, we think we're so advanced, but the 20th century, which you guys weren't even born in, were you? So you're like, good, I'm glad you got that out of the way. The 20th century was the, the most violent century in the history of Earth. Brought about by political philosophy. And that political philosophy was brought about by certain other philosophies. Belief that whether or not God exists or doesn't exist. Belief in what justice is and what justice isn't. What is today a matter of academic speculation begins tomorrow to move armies and pull down empires. Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, do you think that they thought hundreds of millions of people would die as a result of that 30-page paper they wrote called the Communist Manifesto? When they talked about revolution, do you think they thought millions upon millions of people would die? And when Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez use the word revolution today, do you think that they are considering the consequences of those, of that language? Do you think they care? When you see the riots in the streets of groups that are literally Marxist groups right now, do you think they want to discuss, have a discussion with you over what is just and unjust? Or do you think that they think that if you disagree with them, they want to destroy you? Because philosophy has consequences. And, the con and by the way, now what prompted me to discuss this today was the, the realization, I watched a lecture where the guy was making it clear. Well, all of you know about Hitler to some degree. What you don't know much about is how the last century was the most deadly of all centuries in the history of the world 
based on an idea, because of an idea. And he was saying, he asked the question, why don't you know it? Why don't you know how many millions of people were killed as a result of the ideas of communism? It has to do with who controls what you know. It turns out that if you were going to a public school right now, I always pick on U of H because they're right down the street. It could be, it could be Texas A&M. It could be UT, especially UT. I wouldn't be surprised yet for sure. I do know a couple good professors there. I'm friends with one of them. Um, you know, that the, it's not all bad, but by and large, the vast majority of education is run by people, educators, who are sympathetic to communism. That communism got a foothold in education somewhere around the 30s in America, 1930s, not you know, also. It started, and, and you had the great, you, you had the Red Scare in the 50s, right? Where educators, the filmmakers, that where these people were being really targeted, and, and McCarthy was like, Are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And the guy would say, I'm not a member of the Communist Party. I just went to this one meeting. This one beautiful girl took me to the meeting. And that was like this constant, you know, defense. I was taken by this girl. I want to know who this girl is, right? Because she seems to be the only, you know, communist out there. Well, anyway, once the Red Scare was over, it didn't get rid of the communists out of Hollywood and it didn't get rid of them out of education. They still exist. And how do you learn about your world through media, yeah. whether it be from education, right? Through the schools you went through, K through 12 and now into college, especially, and you were more likely to believe what you heard when you were K through 12. You just sat there, listened and were tested. You didn't hear the other side, right? It's not about debate. It's about passing the stupid exam. So education in and, and, and the films, and when they tell you about the Red Scare, who's the bad guys? Well, it's McCarthy for sure. It's the people who are afraid of communism. It's not the people who were accused of communists. It never talks about us actually finding communists in our midst and finding uh, spies amongst us, which we did find them, okay? So uh, beware. Beware of the ideas that are being planted in your head. I'm just saying be nice and skeptical about them, especially politically, okay? Because you're at that age right now, everybody wants your vote. Everybody wants your, you're now of the voting age. You just turned, you have, you have value to people now, to politicians. You turned 18 and now they want something from you your ballot. I'm going to tell you what you want to hear. Okay? Let's do some philosophy about truth. Okay? It's hard to get true numbers on the deaths of people. I could say 100 million. I don't know because we don't know how many people, but we do know that the result of communism was the death of many, many, many people. Okay? And we'd ask the question, do, is it true that it would be bad to embrace this type of regime again. And if it's true that it would be bad, then maybe we should rethink who we vote for, okay? Even if the news tells us to vote one way. Okay, that's my endorsement, okay? Remember, sound one hand clapping. Beware, we're all biased. We talked about the different types of truth the other day, and now that you have watched the video, if you were not there, or if you attended this class and were here, thankfully, you do know the three theories of truth, correct? Good. Last time we talked about belief. I discussed belief, but you wouldn't have seen it by now because the video just went up this morning, like somewhere at like five in the morning. Now, if I don't give you the announcement, the best way to know when the video goes up is to subscribe to, subscribe to the channel, and YouTube will tell you when my videos are posted. Like if it went up at two in the morning last night, it may have, or this morning, 
I was in bed. I'm not going to write you an email at that time telling you where to go. But YouTube will, okay, if you subscribe. So that's that's you know a little plug there. So last time we talked about when we moved on from from the three theories of truth and we moved on to belief. And I told the last class what belief was. What is a belief? I told the last class on the video, so if you watch it, it is a psychological disposition to hold a proposition to be true. I said that it is a psychological disposition to hold a proposition to be true. Now, if I move on quickly, it's because it's on the video and you're expected to watch the video. Okay? So the psychological disposition to hold a proposition is true tells us we should probably know what a proposition is. And I've already told you, I think, I told you, that a proposition is a statement that's either true or false. If God exists is a statement that's either true or false. If God exists, it is true. If it is false, you know, if God doesn't exist, then it's false. Okay? If God exists, therefore it's true. We use propositions all the time in court, in documents, in statements about truth all the time, okay? So belief is a, pro a, a psychological disposition. It's a mental state. It's a mental state. It's a psychological disposition to hold a proposition to be true. Nothing weird about that. So you got justified true belief as knowledge. Then we talked about realism and phenomenalism. And I gave you two types of realism. Realism, you had direct realism. This is, I'm not going to give this lecture over. And you had indirect realism. Now you're looking at me like, why aren't you going to give this over, right? It's on the video. It's, it's okay, totally on the video. You got to watch it. And this is totally, this is testable, okay? I always have questions on direct realism and indirect realism and how they're similar and how they are different, okay? So that's all in lecture seven. This is lecture eight. So if you want uh, realism and you want the distinction between realism and phenomenalism, well, then we're going to have to discuss, you, you have to go back to that. You want to know how uh, indirect realism is uh, similar to phenomenalism. But then, of course, <laughs> you, want, you want to know how they're different. Okay. So that's my notes on what you need to know from the last lecture. I always want to tie you to that. Today, I think we need to talk a little bit about foundationism. What is foundationalism? I put, said originally foundationism. It's foundationalism. Foundationalism. What is a foundation? Do we have any construction you know, workers here? Anybody's ever built a house? Understand anything, the concept of houses and stuff? Go ahead, sir. Uh, you start from the bottom up, so. Yeah, you don't start from the top down. The foundation has to be like flat. Has to be flat. And everybody has, everything has to be level. What's a foundation? Just tell me what a foundation is. Uh, well, I mean, I know you can, like, it's the, it's the bottom surface of the house. And the bottom. That's, that's part. That's, <laughs> it's the starting point, right? And you put the foundation on earth. Okay? And if earth is the foundation for the foundation, great. Okay? Um, in, it's that bottom part from which we build up. Does that make sense? Now, foundationalism has to do with beliefs and belief structures. And listen to this cool term I'm going to give you. It's called a noetic structure. N-O-E-T-I-C, noetic, noetic structure. What is a noetic structure? A noetic structure is a collection of beliefs in their relationship to one another. A noetic structure is a set of beliefs in their, their relationship to one another. It's basically how they support one another. Okay. So imagine a house of cards. 
you know, that's a pretty flimsy thing, right? Let's just say a house of cards, each card represents a belief. And you start pulling at cards, falsifying, that, that, that means I'm falsifying each belief. Each time I pull a card, I'm showing the belief to be false. Eventually the whole structure falls apart, doesn't it? Because, especially, if I pull cards from the bottom, what happens when you pull cards from the bottom? The cards on top fall. It implodes. Because you base certain beliefs on your foundational beliefs. You start with a belief down here and you build up on top of it. Make sense to y'all? A foundational belief though, we will also call properly basic beliefs or just you have what are called basic beliefs and so then you have properly basic beliefs. A properly basic belief is a belief that does not need to be supported by any other beliefs. A properly basic belief is a belief that does not need to be supported by any other beliefs. I think, therefore, I am. My own existence is a properly basic belief. It is a foundational belief. It is a belief that needs not have any other beliefs to support it. And from that belief, I can support other beliefs, put other beliefs on top of it. That is going to be, if we imagine our house of cards, right? That would be one tough card to get out of there, would you agree? And so you're not any belief supporting on, on top of that is more firmly founded, secure. It's more secure. There are some beliefs that are easily falsified and thus, anything placed on top of them is on shaky ground, if that makes sense. So what we want to do, epistemologically speaking, if we want to gain truth and avoid falsehood, which is the goal of epistemology, ultimately gaining knowledge in epistemology, that is, we want to have as strong foundational beliefs as we can Therefore, anything being placed upon that is on more sure ground, that we can be more certain of our beliefs. That's why it helps us to be more skeptical of those people who come up and tell us to believe things so that we don't just go believe things and create a noetic structure, a structure of beliefs, a house of cards, right? We want a house of bricks. We go with the three pigs, we don't want straw or wood, we want bricks, and we want it on a firm foundation, right? The scripture even tells us that, right? We found ourselves on the rock, right? Anything else is just sinking sand. So, some people believe that there are no such things as foundational beliefs. And these are coherentists. Now, remember in the three, you won't remember because you didn't watch. Did you watch the three theories of truth? You did because you've been here. So you've all got the three theories of truth. Coherentists, the coherence theory of truth is a theory of truth, but there's a theory of when it comes to beliefs and noetic structures called coherentism. Okay? Where they do not believe in foundationalism, they are anti foundationalists. They don't believe that there are any beliefs that don't require other beliefs. They believe that all beliefs require justification from other beliefs. Does that make sense? Now, I would argue that that first belief I gave you, I exist, there, uh, I am, therefore, I think, therefore, I am, foundational belief. I don't, I, I have no need to, uh, uh, to believe in anything about that. Okay, I don't need to support that with other beliefs. Properly basic beliefs may also be beliefs that may be supported by other beliefs, but they need not be justified by other beliefs. 
just because it can be justified by other beliefs, it doesn't follow that it needs to be justified by other beliefs. Okay? You could have foundational beliefs that are or can be justified by other beliefs. It just, just, just because it's a foundational belief, what it says is that it doesn't have to be. That you can know it properly. Okay? What are some things you can know without having another belief about it? Besides your existence. Right? You can know that you are having an experience right now. Do you need to believe something about that? Can you? Can you justify that belief with another belief? The answer is yes, you probably can. Upon reflection, you could say, I'm having an experience right now. Well, why do I believe this? Well, I believe that I exist, and uh, how do I know I exist? Because I think thinking is an experience, you know, or the being presented to by phenomena is that, and I believe that, and I believe, and now this stuff going occurring is, uh, falls under that. Therefore, you know, you could do all that mental garbage. But the reality is, do you have to? No. Why? Because it is self-evident. Interestingly enough, that notion of self-evidence was discussed in what American document? Oh, the, the Declaration. It is the Declaration of Independence. That is, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Who wrote that? Thomas Jefferson. And what is he doing? He is. What is he using? He's using philosophy. What? area of philosophy, epistemology. We hold these truths, which is having to do with truth, and he's having to do with evidence. We hold them as being self-evident, self-evident, not that we can't reflect upon them and think about them and give other justifications for it, but that it is foundational that we have the right to life. But you cannot come up to me and tell me I have to defend the notion that I have a right to life. It is self-evident that I have it just as much as I am having an experience right now. Whether that experience and my, how I perceive it is true to how it actually is is something else, but it cannot be denied that I am having an experience. It is self-evident. Now that experience may accurately depict the world or help me accurately depict the world, but it's an experience nonetheless, and thus it is foundational. My belief that I'm having an experience is a foundational belief, okay? My foundational belief that I have the right to life may be defended by other beliefs. It need not be. Uh, I would argue that you would fight for your right to, li uh, to life before you could even express why you believe you have it. Children in the womb literally fight off the suction device that is coming for them. That's why I think her name is Lila Rose, is it? I look to you like you would know this. Uh, she's the, the big, um, you know, pro-life woman and uh, March for Life and all that, she does that. She was a, um, she was a, she worked at Planned Parenthood just down the street, right by U of H, the biggest one in the nation. And she had to assist in an abortion and when she watched child fighting it off that changed her mind she went oh my god what are we doing and that's after i think she had two abortions or so interesting the infant did not know how to articulate the right to life but it sure fought for it right you have this foundational belief that even pre-linguistically one knows okay Foundational beliefs. What is a foundational belief? It's a belief upon which we base other beliefs. The question is, are foundational beliefs basic beliefs? That is, beliefs that need not be supported by other beliefs. I argue that there are many basic beliefs beliefs out there, and I'm not the only one, I'm not like some unique guy who defends foundationalism, okay? This is a debate that goes on in epistemology. Now think of this. If beliefs have to have beliefs to support them, 
okay? What happens is you get what's called an infinite regress. What is an infinite regress? It would say, I have belief one that needs to be supported by belief two. And belief two needs to be supported by belief three. And belief three needs to be supported by belief four, right? Five, six, seven. How many beliefs do you have? Take one belief of yours and see how far you can go back in defending it with other beliefs, right? And somebody might say, if you cannot support your belief with other beliefs, and people do, then you are not having, you are making assumptions. You are not justified in holding that belief. It would, none of our beliefs would be justified because you would have what's called an infinite regress and none of us have an infinite number of beliefs about the support of one belief. That would mean every one belief of yours would have to have an infinite number of beliefs to support it. And by the way, you cannot cross an actual infinite. Because if you had a hundred bajillion, and that's a made up number, sextillion is not, right? It goes million, billion, trillion, quadrillion, quintillion for five, sextillion for six. Do you know how many beliefs that is? And it goes off to like, I don't know what the seven is, so that's why I kind of stopped it there. But then it gets to octillion, right? Man, that is a lot of beliefs. And I don't have them, okay? You would never have knowledge. You don't have knowledge. It's an infinite regress. And that is, that is what they say uh, about beliefs. They say, that, you know, foundationalism doesn't exist. You're, you, you know, you basically, you know, um, you have to support them with other beliefs, but if you do, then you got this infinite regress. Well, then you got the coherentists who argue, well, that's not really how it is. And they would say your noetic structure isn't up and down. It's like a web, like a spider web. And each belief supports itself, and it, you don't get this, what's called a vicious regress, but you get what's called circular reasoning that A supports B, B supports C, C supports D, E support, D supports E, E supports F, F all the way to Z and Z supports A. And that's like pulling yourself up with your own bootstraps. Do you know what, there's a term called bootstrapping and it's not a good term. Well, it can be. A guy who pulls himself up by his own bootstraps, you, you know, who, know, who does not know what bootstraps are? We're in Texas, you all should know what bootstraps are. Are you from Texas? Texas. You're, you're from Houston though, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, you, we're from a major city. You're from the country, you know, where there are horses, and people ride horses. That would mean they wear boots. Oh, and, like the straps on the saddles? Like, yeah, the sides, we oh. pull up your boots. Oh. And so you're, you hold on to your boots, and then you pull yourself up and you're off the ground now, can you do that? No matter how hard you pull, you cannot do that, right? Well, that's kind of what it is. It's like saying, I am getting these, this knowledge off the ground by supporting A with Z and Z supports A, which means that's self it, it's a circular reasoning, right? It's kind of like saying, I'm a prophet. Well, how do you know? Well, because I told you. Why should I believe you? Because prophets don't lie. Well, how do, you, how do I know you're not a, how do I know you're a prophet? because I just told you. See, I just went in a big circle. I supported each statement. Each statement was supported, but it was circular. Does that make sense to you? And that's kind of what the coherentists do. Now, now of course, to the coherentist, it's not that simple. The web is much bigger than this, okay? And there are many, many, many more beliefs involved. But ultimately it does the same. It's not a vicious regress going from top down to the bottom through the floor and ongoing into infinity. It infinitely goes in a circle. It's called viciously circular. So it really falls under the same criticism. 
So what's the answer to that is foundationalism, which they want to reject anyway, because they don't believe in foundational beliefs. The coherentist says, look, you guys don't have it because every belief has to be justified by another belief. It goes straight through the floor right into, into infinity. We suggest it's a noetic structure that is based on a web, web of belief. There are no foundational beliefs. It's just a web of belief floating, right, in midair. Which, by the way, to, to say coherentism is true is a foundational belief, if that's what they start with. Well, how do you know? Well, because it fits our web of beliefs, which is circular. Well, okay, well, no reason for me to believe that. Foundationalism argues for foundational beliefs. It is our best chance for knowledge. Because coherentism, again, allows for you to have your own structure of beliefs. It embraces the coherentist theory of truth. Means that two propositions, conflicting propositions, contradicting con uh, propositions, can both be considered true. There would be your truth and my truth, right? Your knowledge and my knowledge, and they cannot both be true at the same time. God can exist and non exist. The earth is flat, the earth is non flat, and we can both say we know it, right? You have different systems of justice. Slavery is morally good, slavery is morally evil. And it all depends on who holds the, 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 the beliefs. Okay? Now from the coherentist view, worldview, is they start to believe that it's not the individual, which it does break down into, okay? Let's not kid ourselves. But culturally you will have these dogs that what are called dogsastic practices and noetic structures. A dogsastic practice, I'm gonna there's a uh, vocabulary word that would will certainly most certainly be on the test, just like noetic structure will be. Uh, a dogsastic practice is a belief forming practice. This is why we get moral relativism. When you get epistemology. The dogsastic practice is a belief forming practice. A belief forming practice. Okay? This is why you get moral relativism. When you get epistemological, epistemic relativism, your knowledge is your knowledge, my knowledge is my knowledge, then you get moral knowledge that's your knowledge, moral knowledge, and I am my moral knowledge, right? Well, it may be true for you, it's not true for me. That's why, and then you go, well, we're making claims here that Jesus is Lord, okay? This is Houston Baptist University. That is a proposition. You didn't come to U of H, right? You didn't go to UT or Texas A&M. You came to a private Christian school with a mission. And the mission is to tell you that Jesus is Lord, which is a proposition that is true or false, right? It is not a free-floating idea, a belief that we just came up with. We support this idea, but there are foundational beliefs upon which we support this statement as being true. Now, if there is no foundation, there is no foundation, there is no solid foundation for the belief that Jesus is Lord in a real robust kind of way. You could have a web of beliefs, a belief, I suppose, that in there supports the idea that Jesus is the Lord, but you will have, somebody else will have another one. But we're saying Jesus is the Lord of all. Not just within my group. Not just within my group of belief-forming practitioners at my church. But that even if you believe that Jesus is not Lord, you may be wrong, right? According to coherentism, right and wrong is dependent on the community of believers, 
the individual within that dogsastic practice, the web of beliefs, right? Within foundationalism, truth has to do going back to that correspondence sense. The way the world really is. And that's, listen, remember where I gave you the five, who, what, where, when, why, and how, and I said the most important one is, why is this important to you? This is important to you because if it is true, in a correspondence sense, then you are responsible, able to respond at this point. I have given you it. Jesus is Lord. Now you must do something with it. Okay? You either treat him as such or you deny him as such. Right? Now some will go, I well, of course, I, you know, it's, it's good for you. Well, that's fine. Then you're saying he's not my Lord. Let's get theological here for a second. What does lordship mean? This is a big de de debate in uh, morality, in theology, and you have certain groups of Christians who believe that morality is dictated by culture and so should our theology be. Well, that makes culture the Lord of God, right? Rather than God, the Lord of culture. Where, what should follow who, which? Should we follow the Lord and let God dictate our culture or should we let culture dictate what we think about God hint it's the, it's the first one we should let God dictate culture okay we don't say well culture says this and culture accepts homosexuality now and culture accepts abortion now therefore God must accept it no lordship would say People are rejecting the lordship of God who uh, has specific ideas about human sexuality and how we treat the unborn, okay? And we would say they reject his lordship. And a church that says what? It's okay to have an abortion or that it's okay to, you know, have these types of unions. We would say they're outside of, of what God's will is. That's the idea of lordship. It doesn't change right he's lord we change around it he does not we are, we are either under the lordship or we are not now if it's true that jesus is lord now that becomes a real there's some pressure under that right and you can understand why making such statements like this given our uh, appetites for sex and for freedom from responsibility of children I have three and sometimes I'm like boy I wish I can go out but I can't because I got these three kids right you can understand with the appetites of that how we would be desired desiring that God's will were otherwise and that if we could only manipulate God's will somehow or to rationalize it away and we could use epistemology which it has been done to show we can't know God's will or we can only know what we believe about certain beliefs and they're justified and there are no foundational beliefs. Therefore, your belief structure is yours and his is his. These are pretty important questions, would you agree? They're at least hotbed questions, correct? Worth fighting about. Meaning a lot of people fight over this stuff. A lot of people are really angry at the idea that Roe versus Wade may be overturned. Who knows what Roe versus Wade is? None of you? Okay, tell me, okay, let's, you're men, you have nothing to say about this. That's a lie. I'm joking. You have plenty to say about this. What's Roe versus Wade? Um, court case. Court case that what? Um, made abortion effective. That made abortion yeah. the law of the land. That gave women the legal right to an abortion. That's, I say legal right because they don't have a natural right to kill their babies. That, I argue that. Okay. But, It is a philosophical debate, it contains knowledge, truth claims, theological claims, right? About the nature of man, humans, do all humans have the right to life, even if they're geographically located in the womb? Do we all bear the omago dei, that is the image of God, 
which is what gives us the right to life, right, the, the theological, has to do with epistemological issues. How do you know when, quote, life begins? Well, we know, you know, that all the material is living. The question is, when do rights enter into the human? When do humans get the right? Do all humans have it? And so, and so when women want to have abortions or, or husbands or boyfriends are pressuring or, or parents are pressuring daughters into having abortion, then they're like, I have no daughter of mine's going to be like this. I'm taking you get your butt down there. And, they, and then this is real. I mean, this is real. A lot of abortions are not exactly the woman's choice as we one people, a lot of people would argue. It's a very emotional thing, so people start, this is very important. This is philosophy dictating what you believe about, or at least being used to justify what you want on a social situation, on a moral de decision. Who you sleep with, right, is another one. Certain men want to have sex with other men, and you go, well, philosophically, you can make an argument against that. Medically, you can make an argument against it. Morally, you can make an argument against it. Biblically, you make an argument against it. But appetites and emotions get involved, and then philosophy gets used, okay? And so foundationalism is a very important topic when we're talking about knowledge, about how do you know? What are the things you believe that you need no other belief to justify? What are they? And from the, So you build your house and don't build a house of cards. If you build on emotions, have emotional beliefs, those are cards that are easily flicked away. The house will fall. You want the strong ones. Make sense? What's a dog's astic practice? Those would be four good factors. Okay, good note, sir. What is a noetic structure? A collection of beliefs and their relationship with one another. That's amazing. I, it sound, you sounded like this. Oh. <laughs> like Stu. I'm just picking on you, Stu. Stu? No, wait. What's your, what's your first name? Oh, boy. Drew. <laughs> You did not just call me Stu. Oh, it's a great name. Oh, Stuart's boy. a great name. It's Drew, right? Yeah. I knew it re re reminded me of ooh, and I didn't want to say Gru from, from yeah. Despicable Me. Glad you didn't. Little girls, little girls. It's got the little puppet. Do you remember that one? All right. So we got no other structure, dogsastic practice. What's coherentism? Tism. Anytime you hear ism, that's not a good thing. Well, it's not all bad. I'm a foundationalist, which means I, I'm into foundationalism. There are different types of foundationalism, by the way, and different strengths of it, okay? So you have traditional foundationalism. You have modest foundationalism. I'm not necessarily going to test you on that. That's, that's if you take a further class in epistemology, okay? That, that would make you really cool in my yeah, you're gonna take one? Or no, you just have a good question. Go ahead. Uh, so you mentioned coherentism a couple times, and I have a couple different. Yeah, tell me what, what you have. So I have the first thing that you said, which was anti foundational. Yeah, they're anti foundationalists. So that is, they deny that there are any foundational beliefs. And then, but after that, you mentioned that you can have your own set of beliefs. That's true. So because for the, for the coherentists, they believe that um, knowledge is really a collection of beliefs. And we're talking when we're talking about coherentism and foundation, we're talking about noetic structures. What's a noetic structure? Yeah, and how they relate to each other. From the if you think of a foundational belief, okay? brought it today. There is a marker in here, I promise. Um, or at least I promise I put it in here. If it fell out, then I'm in trouble. Hopefully I'm still on camera, am I? Good. So imagine a foundational, a foundation of a, we'll call that the foundation, call that earth underneath, whatever. There's just, 
this is the bottom. And then you believe, you know, you put a belief here, number one, B1, and then B2, and B3. Now, you build up from your bottom belief. And now you can have other foundational beliefs that might help support each other, right? We'll call this uh, B1 subscript A. How's that? And then uh, uh, B2 subscript A. And, you know, of course, they support each other somehow and maybe whatever. You get a structure like that. They kind of, it's just kind of like a building. And that's, but you got these what are called basic beliefs, otherwise known as properly basic beliefs. Um, properly basic belief. If you ever see that in epistemology, you go, oh, basic belief. Properly basic belief is a belief that need not be supported by any other belief, but it may have other beliefs to support it. It just doesn't need it. Needing and having them are two different things. Some would say a belief has to have, um, you know, a basic belief is one that you can't support with other beliefs, okay? And I believe that there are some beliefs like that, such as I think, therefore I am, I have my existence. I don't know if I could support that somehow. I mean, other than the fact that I go, other than my, uh, the fact that I have a belief that I am having an experience right now, right? But my, my existence seems to be so self-evident um, that I can't get that far with trying to justify it beyond its own, you know, obviousness, okay? Let's go to the coherentist view. The coherentist view thinks in terms of webs, okay, of beliefs. You'll notice there's a, a foundation here. Whereas over here, we're gonna say there is no foundation. It's like you've got each one of these is a belief. And you'll notice how it's circled around on itself here. So you have B1, B2, B, and the B stands in this case for beliefs, if you, if you haven't figured that one out, all right? Belief one, belief two supports belief three, belief four, belief five, you see how it gets pretty far down the line, it could get even farther than that. And it gets so bad that I'm off my web now, <laughs> okay? This is belief six and seven and belief eight, which now goes all the way back and supports belief one. See how circular? Okay, the anti-foundationalists would say this belief one has to be supported by this belief zero, which would be belief negative one, belief <laughs> negative two, Edward, yeah, all the way onward to infinity. But there is no actual in infinite, okay? We couldn't do it even if we wanted to, okay? Now, the web of belief, actually, they would say, so this belief one, this will support a belief over here and a belief over here, and, and it keeps going. All the way around, you got this big noetic structure that is much like a web. And you'll notice it just keeps going. There is nothing, it is, it's not attached to anything. So, let's just call this your, let's just call this your noetic structure. But what about Drew's? noetic structure. Yeah, he has his mind. own web of belief over here. Oh yeah, that's my web. And they are different beliefs. Okay? And they contradict yours. Okay? So he could have the belief that God exists, whereas you would say God doesn't exist. And your web of belief supports that belief, that God doesn't exist. His believes that it does. And so he would say, he has knowledge, and you have knowledge. But knowledge about what? About your web of beliefs. 
not about reality. Okay? Only on your own web. And that's why the coherentist makes it clear. They're not making claims about reality. They're making claims about sets of beliefs. It's a, it's a very subjective view of knowledge. What do I mean by subjective versus objective? Talks about the subject rather than the object. Talks about the person rather than that which they are uh, about the objects of knowledge, about reality outside of them. It's inward rather than outward. You're talking about yourself, and I'm just using you as some, a reference to point at at this point. You're talking to yourself about yourself rather than about, like if I'm talking about the table here and I say the table exists, and now I have all these beliefs that justify why I have that belief the table exists, the coherentist is saying, you're not talking about the table, you're talking about your set of beliefs about me. But in reality, I'm not a coherentist, I'm a foundationalist, I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about the darn table. It exists rather, whether I believe it or not. In coherentism, coherentism says you construct reality through language and beliefs. Coherentism suggests you construct reality through language and beliefs. And then, by the way, this is why I get really angry at the um, typical secular college is because this is the kind of epistemology they sell you that you actually construct reality through language and beliefs. And that's why there's this big push with the, with this cancel culture that hates how we use language. That it's all about, they believe we can change genders by, by changing what we call ourselves. Okay, that if you identify as a certain thing, then you could be that thing, right? According to them, you are that thing if you identify with it. If you call yourself it, you know, you use the language around it. It doesn't say you're wrong, though. The, if you're your correspondence theory of truth, the foundation, you're gonna say, no, you could have those beliefs and still be way off the mark. Does that make sense? Now, ironically, uh, sadly, these people kind of are shapeshifters because they tend to be, they tend to not let other people get away with it. Did we run out of time? And nobody's saying, dude, you gotta, you're out of time. How much time we got left? One minute. That was pretty darn good. Any other questions? None? You got a question? I mean, I don't know what the is. We got 30 seconds. What is it? Okay, then stay tuned for your question next time. All right.